Hey y'all, it's Dana from DAS Financial Aid Consulting Services. I'd like to welcome you in to another episode of Let's Talk Financial Aid for College. This uh, episode, we are going to be dedicating it to updates regarding the 2024-2025 FAFSA. Uh, first though, let's do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, again, my name is Dana Anderson. Sharples, and I am the owner of DAS Financial Aid Consulting Services and also the creator of Financial Aid Compliance Solutions. Let's Talk Financial Aid for College came to be after working in this industry for 17, over 17 years. I realized that there are quite a few folks out there, especially with the amount of student loan debt we have here in the United States that need a little bit of guidance with regards to how this system actually works. Uh, so that is why I started the podcast and it's been going strong since 2019 and I'd like to uh, thank everyone for their support um, throughout the years uh, since this podcast began. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is go over the 2024 20. 25 FAFSA. Um, this year, due to the FAFSA Simplification Act that was passed in December of 2020, and that was right after the 2020 election and before President Biden was inaugurated on January 20th of 2021, this act had was uh, approved or by Congress. The Simplification Act not only revised the whole entire FAFSA application, but the whole entire processing system of where the awards from the applications are, again, processed, uh, have all been changed. And as all of us know, when there is a new procedure put in place with a new system, there's always going to be some glitches. And right now, we're in the glitch phase of the new FAFSA. The new FAFSA was supposed to have been launched and released sometime in December, and they backed that date up all the way to December 31st on New Year's Eve. Um, there have been several folks commenting on the their Facebook forum, Federal Students Aid's Facebook page, with regards to having difficulty completing the FAFSA, um, they're not able to access the FAFSA. So I just want to clarify that there is a notification on the home page of studentaid.gov where you go and apply for the FAFSA that says a better 2024-2025 FAFSA form. It is available for short periods of time while the, mon the site is monitored for performance and update the form to provide you with a better experience. I did uh, do recall seeing on Saturday they had posted a bunch of times of when the FAFSA form would be available. But then again, there was an issue and another announcement made on their Facebook page indicating that there are difficulties uh, with linking the FAFSA form to the IRS uh, web, the IRS system because the Eternal Revenue System was being updated for the 2023 tax season. So there was an outage there. So for those of you that have been trying to complete the 2024-2025 FAFSA form, that's a little bit about what's going on and why you may have be having some difficulty accessing it or completing it. I also want to reiterate that with this FAFSA simplification, there are new requirements with regards to students needing to have their own FSA ID number. So that means that the students who are completing these FAFSA, whether they require parental information or they are required spousal information if they're married to be added to the FAFSA, the student has to complete the FSA. They have to get their ID first. And as process 
of filling out the new FAFSA form, they have to invite either the parent, if the parent's required, or a dependent student as a contributor. Physically invite them to complete the form. Or they have to physically invite their spouse to complete the form. There is no parent going in and completing the FAFSA form for their students. I saw a bunch of comments with regards to parents saying, okay, I'm going to complete this for my student. And, and it, that's not the way that this has been set up. And the main reason why is for security purposes. And I will just put it out there that if you're trying to fill out a FAFSA form for your student, you're essentially committing identity theft. Your students should be above the age of 18 at this point in time or the age of majority to be able to complete their own FAFSA application. You would not be able to go to a bank and fill out a loan application on behalf of another individual unless you were provided with court ordered guardianship over not only the person but their estate. And if that's the case, then usually that individual, if you're a guardian over that person, they're not of able mind and body to be able to complete the FAFSA form. So this is the reason why the new requirements have been put in place, to stop identity theft and vice versa. That's why when the FAFSA was being completed in 2022, 2023, and 2023, 2024, there were a lot of FAFSAs that were completed with incorrect information by the student on behalf of either their spouse or their parent. You can't do that on the new FAFSA. So I'm just, again, giving you some guidance there. I also wanted to um, provide you with a bit of information regarding FAFSA deadlines because the 2020, everybody knows in this business and students need to know that the FAFSA form is linked to the state deadlines regarding scholarships and grants. And if you don't get the FAFSA completed in time for before the deadline for the particular state, then you're gonna miss out on the opportunities for scholarship and grants that are funded through the state. So there are there is a link through studentaid.gov with regards to the FAFSA deadlines, and I highly encourage everyone to go there. Before you complete the FAFSA, familiarize yourself with the requirements and also your state deadlines. Now, college and career trade schools have different deadlines. So I recommend that if you are planning on going to a college and that is a career or trade school, that you contact them and make sure that you're aware of any deadlines that they may have on their own. That that's aside from state deadlines and it's aside from <clears throat> excuse me federal book deadlines. Having said all that, when you fill out the 2024-2025 FAFSA, you're working with 2022 federal tax information. There are a lot of folks out there that may have worked in the year of 2022 we came out of the covid restrictions there were more people employed i'm also going to put it out there that there are also a lot of folks that are working who may have not filed tax returns based on the fact that they don't have social security numbers because they have entered the country and have not completed the entire process of getting legit social security numbers and there are now uh, there is now a provision for the start of the 2024-2025 award year which begins on July 1st and runs through June 30th of 2025 that incarcerated individuals are now eligible to complete the FAFSA and receive taxpayer dollars to fund their education while they're incarcerated. 
Again, this is based on that FAFSA Simplification Act that was passed in December of 2020. And right now I'd like to just educate folks that when you are voting uh, in a federal election, you are voting for elected officials who make these decisions. And a lot of folks are voting for personality versus policy, and you need to educate yourselves on the policy and forget about personality. Because right now, what's happening in the United States with regards to funding federal student loans is not acceptable for taxpayers. Because the money is being given and there are promissory notes that are being signed for these direct student loans that are tied with the FAFSA. And those promissory notes are promises to pay back the money. But as we all know, there is trillions of dollars, $1.6 trillion and growing in student loan debt for students that haven't paid their loans. And yes, I understand that some of them have loans out there prior to COVID and that there were some hardships going on during the COVID and there was this day on interest accrual, but no one said that you never had to pay your loans. And some of them were on payment pause, but even during the payment pause, you could have still been paying on those loans. If you chose to do the payment pause and extend your loan period out for another several years because you did not pay on the balance owed, then you need to plan on paying, restarting your payments and going forward and, and paying what you can. Now, there's going to be, I'm going to do another episode regarding the whole repayment plan, but I will tell you that the Biden administration's touting a save plan, which is just a renaming of the income driven repayment plan that was established long before the payment pause went into effect for the COVID-19 emergency and was extended far too long under the Biden administration. So just, there are some uh, episodes that I have done previously that have touched on that, but there's a lot of chatter going on in the news because of the 2024 election cycle coming up. And President Biden and his administration, Secretary Cardona, the, ed sec the Secretary of Education, is, is trying to take credit for some student loan forgiveness that he had they had nothing to do with. And I've been monitoring that as well. So I'm, I'm going to just explain real quickly that if you see in the media that President Biden and Secretary Cardona are trying to say that they were the ones that were in charge of releasing this student loan forgiveness, this had nothing, the, the student loans that have been forgiven had nothing to do with President Biden. It just so happened that this was the public service loan forgiveness that was, insta, insta, I'm sorry, was uh, part of the um, College Reduction and Accessibility Act that was passed under President George W. Bush in 2007. And students who had made their qualifying 120 payments and worked part time, I mean, full time for qualifying employers are the ones that are giving, getting their loans forgiven under the guidelines of the public student loan forgiveness. They signed up for it, they completed the terms of the agreement, and now they're able to get the rest of their student loans forgiven. That was, that was all part of it. And it just so happened that these payments and the, the, the whole part of the payments were completed under the Biden administration. So don't be hoodwinked thinking that this gentleman, had, you know, the president, 
can take credit for this because it can't. And second of all, I just want to point out that the Supreme Court ruled back in June of 2023 that he couldn't forgive all of those loans that he was planning on forgiving. So now he's trying to take credit for the public service loan forgiveness loans. So just be careful and inform yourselves with regards to how this is all playing out. Now back to the 2024-2025 FAFSA. <clears throat> What's new is the form expands eligibility for federal student aid, including Pell Grants, and provides a streamlined user experience. 610,000 new students from low-income backgrounds will be eligible to receive federal Pell Grants due to updates to student loan calcu aid calculations. Plus, applicants will be able to skip as many as 26 questions depending on their individual circumstances. Some applicants could answer as few as 18 questions, which could take less than 10 minutes. Okay, let's just clarify that right now we have several students out there that are low income. As they said, 610,000 is what the projection is. <clears throat> If you are a low-income student, you need to make sure that while you're eligible for the Pell Grant <clears throat> and you're going to be eligible for loans, because when someone fills out the FAFSA, they don't do an ability to pay. Like you, when you go to a bank to apply for a mortgage or a car loan, <clears throat> you have to do a debt-to-income ratio in order to be determined whether or not you qualify for a loan. Well, in federal student aid, they don't have ability to pay. So you don't have to prove that you have any ability to pay the loans that you're taking out. And you can take out as much as $250,000 up to a grad student and not show ability to pay. So all of these folks that are in student loan debt right now and are crying foul should have been told from the get-go that you would be required to pay back those loans. You don't have to pay back a Pell Grant if you qualify because Pell Grant is what they call free money, but it technically isn't free money because the taxpayers are providing you with that money. And the reason why the taxpayers are providing you with that money is so that we can help generate a uh, group of folks that are going to be going out once they graduate into the community they're going to have jobs and then they're going to pay into the system tax wise but as well as pay back their loans so the taxpayers are basically loaning money to the united the citizens of the united states and eligible non-citizens which is that was part of the application to pay for the loans so I just wanted again to clarify that that's how this is all working and I do know that there are several states now that require high school students to complete the FAFSA as a graduation requirement now in the state where I reside in New Hampshire they did pass that law but they also said that you don't have to fill it out you can sign a waiver and then the waiver will be placed into your file. You can still graduate. I recommend, unless you have a plan, if you are a high school student and you, you have a plan, you know how you what college you're gonna go to, you know that you're gonna you know sign up for this amount of money, you know that you're gonna be able to complete your graduation based on the degree that you have selected then by all means, fill out that FAFSA. And the FAFSA does allow up to 20 schools to be listed. Now, I think that's a bit excessive. And I also think that that goes back to when I began working in this industry in 2006, that Schools weren't supposed to be targeting students, and the feds aren't supposed to be targeting students. 
And right now, we're on the cusp of targeting students with what's happening. So I'm just going to put it out there as far as College Financial Aid 101. Do not fill out this FAFSA unless, again, you have a plan. Otherwise, you have to put a college school code on there that's part of the, the whole program. And that school now will be contacting you because they need to get students into their colleges. Otherwise, they're not going to get their funding. Now, you see how this is all playing? So I just wanted to make sure <clears throat> that everybody understands how this is working. So if you, again, know that you're going to go to school, you have a plan. You, you, you've got a means to, while you're in school, you know, setting aside some money so that you can start paying back. And if you have an unsub loan, if you accept an unsub loan from this, do not park the interest. Most of the time, the interest is only $20 a month. And I highly recommend if you can go and, and do your thing um, for 20 bucks, it's a $20 bill. You can pay $20 in interest. And it also looked good for you to build up your credit. So I, I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there for some information. So what happens after you submit that FAFSA form, you'll get an email confirming that the form has been received with preliminary information related to your eligibility for federal student aid. And this will include what they call now, instead of the estimated family contribution, they change that to the student aid index, which is SAI. And estimated eligibility for Pell Grants. They're going to provide you your FAFSA eligibility information to your schools and state in late January. Well, this late January date may be pushed further because right now with what's going on with the system, it, it may be pushed off a little bit further. But it says in late January, so you'll have ample time to fill out the form and do not need to rush to complete the form during the soft launch. launch. Okay. There are a lot of folks though, or students that are looking for early decision from the schools that they're applying to. And you're not going to be able to do early decision if the, you know, the college and, the, and doesn't have the information that they need in order to get your financial aid set up. So again, just I'll keep you updated as best as I can from the federal government. But right now, that's that's what they're saying. They're going to send an email out when the FAFSA sent. FAFSA information has been sent to your selected schools and when you can access your FAFSA submission summary on studentaid.gov. The FAFSA submission summary will provide your official SAI calculation and federal Pell Grant eligibility. You can also check the status of your FAFSA form on studentaid.gov in late January. Because many states have made changes to their aid processes for 2024-2025 award year, please review your state's eligibility and deadline information, which I just gave you that um, information. <clears throat> so the other um, information I'd like to pass along is, is that you can follow Federal Student Aid on social media. They're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And they do have YouTube informal informational videos as well as educational uh, webinars if you want to attend those. So for right now, that's the information that we have uh, been provided uh, with regards to what's going on with the new FAFSA. If you are a student who is in the process of signing up to go to school, mostly career and technical schools have revolving start dates. And if you are starting prior to July 1st of this year, I recommend that you fill up the 2023-2024 FAFSA. That's up and running. It will be up and running until June 30th. You can fill that out and get your school code on it and submit that for processing. 
And depending on when the midpoint of your second disbursement will be, will determine whether or not you have to fill out the 2024-2025 FAFSA. So if you're, say, going to a cosmetology or a massage therapy or truck driving or you have um, an HVAC or electrician um, program that you're looking at, just contact your financial aid office and advisor that has been assigned to you and ask the questions that you need to ask in order to complete it based on your start date. Um, and that, that, that will uh, get your ball rolling and you will not be delayed um, on any of your uh, financial aid that you are eligible to receive. And I also want to put it out there that, again, this 2024-2025 FAFSA, um, they're, they're orchestrating this for the low income. And with everything that's going on with the economy right now, and again, we're dealing with 2022 income and federal tax information. If for some reason you qualify, um, your parents' income may have been very high and you may not qualify for a Pell Grant, you can fill out the FAFSA and that's where you need to start looking for scholarships and you need to look for state aid and you need to look for state grants before you accept the loans. And a lot of folks, uh, I do know that um, they don't go for the scholarships because they don't want to put the work in or they think that they're not going to be eligible to receive it. And I will say that, uh, for example, last week when I was working with one of my clients, uh, we had to reaward one of um, the files that didn't qualify for their student for Pell Grant. The loans had been awarded, but he took the initiative, the student took the initiative to apply for Mike Rose Foundation Scholarship and he won $7,500 towards his education. So that is just one example that if you fill out the, the information for the scholarship, you apply for the scholarship, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars out there, I should say, in scholarship money. And one of the resources that I use to look for scholarships is Scholarship Owl. And it's, they have a variety of scholarships available. Um, there's a free scholarship finder that you can sign up for. There are all kinds of scholarships uh, that don't require an essay. There are um, all kinds of scholarships for whatever category that may be of interest for you. If it's creative writing, there are creative writing ones. So I, I highly recommend that if you're going to be um, pursuing a college, uh, going to college, go to the scholarships and see what are available out there. And I do have another connection that I will share with you. Um, there's a gal in Chicago. Her name is Teresa Harris, and she has um, a business called Scholarship Mama, and that's what she does. She helps students locate scholarships and helps them write their essays. Uh, so that is a good resource that you may uh, want to um, look into. She also has a, um, fa a Facebook page and she holds lives there on um, a regular basis. So you can use her as a resource as well. Um, and you can also follow me on DAS Financial Aid Consulting Services. I have a Facebook page as well as a private group. And if you want to become part of the group, uh, please go ahead and um, go to that page. And um, I will take a look at it. And if you want to join the group, I will let you in. The one thing I will point out is, is that there have been several folks in the past um, who have asked to join the group, um, but they didn't answer the security questions. And if you don't answer the administrative security questions uh, to confirm that you are uh, legitimately interested in becoming um, an active member of the group, 
uh, I'm not going to accept your um, request. So please make sure that um, you fill out those questions. And lastly, uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to email me at danderson at dasfinanciallyconsultingservices.com and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have and guide you through the process as well. But again, I highly recommend if you've already got a school in mind and uh, you've reached out to them, made that connection, go ahead and contact their financial aid office for any additional information that they would require um, to, you know, with applying and um, filling out their financial aid process. So for today, that will be, uh, I'll be closing out the, the podcast. And like I said, I will be um, coming back in a little bit later with the information you need with repayment, student loan repayment, and what's happening with that repayment plan. I hope everyone had a great holiday. I wish everybody a happy and healthy uh, new year. And again, as always, thank you very much for your support and have a great day.